This is just a quick announcement. We're dropping an episode of the new podcast, That Scene, with yours truly, Dan Patrick, right here on your feed. Listen to That Scene with Dan Patrick and your other favorite podcast in the Amazon Music mobile app, on your web browser, or any Echo device. In this episode, Adam Sandler and his longtime writing partner, Tim Herlihy, talk about the scene in Happy Gilmore where Happy fights Bob Barker. I hope you enjoy. You like that, old man? You want a piece of me? I don't want a piece of you. I want the whole thing. Oh! All right, who takes credit for deciding to go with Bob Barker in that role? Well, Hurla, he initially wrote Ed McMahon. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dan Patrick, and this is IMDb's That Scene, an Amazon original, the podcast where I talk to some of Hollywood's top actors, directors, and producers about some of their most iconic scenes that have defined their careers, helped shape the cinematic landscape, and have even become fixtures in pop culture. Today on the show, I have Adam Sandler Yellow. and his writing partner, Tim Herlihy. How you doing, Dan? As we discuss That Scene in Happy Gilmore, where Happy fights Bob Barker. Tim and Adam met in college at NYU where they were roommates. Tim was studying to be an accountant and a lawyer, but somehow Adam convinced him to write jokes for his stand-up acts. When Adam was picked up by Saturday Night Live, Tim continued to collaborate with him and became a staff writer and eventually a producer. Adam and Tim have since collaborated on 22 movies that have grossed a combined $3 billion at the worldwide box office. How did you come up with the idea for Happy Gilmore? Adam uh, Sandler. That was the Sandman that was lucky because I, my dad was a great golfer and we were at a driving range and my, one of my best friends from growing up, Kyle McDonough, who played uh, pro hockey in Norway and his brother Hubie uh, he played for the uh, Islanders and, uh, and works for the Kings and the, it's just a great hockey family, great great people, the McDonough's. But Kyle came to the driving range with me and my dad, and he didn't golf that much, but he was swinging the club and banging it so far. And my father's like, man, those hockey wrists come in handy and that kind of stuff. And then um, I just called Hurley one time. I said, maybe it'd be funny um, if I uh, uh, did a movie about a hockey player, and because he plays hockey, he can drive the ball really far. And uh, he's not making it into the NHL, and he's obsessed with becoming an NHL guy. But uh, in the meantime, to pay the bills, he uh, gets on the pro tour. Something like that, right, Earls? Yeah, yeah. And this was before Billy came out. And we kind of like, I think Bob Simons was pushing us to make another movie because, you know, you never know. You got to get the next movie going before the first one comes out because you never know how the first one's going to do. So um, that was definitely our best idea. And. Even though, I mean, we we're, we both golfed a little, but we weren't like crazy golfers, but we could see how funny it would be. But the fact that you're starting a movie and you don't, you haven't finished the other movie or you don't even know, like the expectation level, how high was it after Billy Madison when you're going to do Happy Gilmore? I think it was, uh, like you said, Hurls, I think it was like protection, like let's get this sucker going before that other one comes out, Billy, because it, uh, if it doesn't do well, they're going to take this all away from us. And I swear to you, uh, Danny, we, we kind of lived like that for 20 years. We were like, every movie we made, we were like, well, you know what? Maybe we should uh, get a deal on this next one because who knows what the hell's going to happen. So we were kind of constantly working. We're finally at the point now where we go, ah, they're probably going to let us do one. So let's we can calm down a little bit. All right, who takes credit for deciding to go with Bob Barker in that role? Well, Hurley, he initially wrote Ed McMahon. <laughs> <laughs> right yeah <laughs> okay when he says that you're gonna hey by the way your character is gonna fight ed mcmahon <laughs> hey, it's just funny thinking about it but what are you thinking about as the well, person who's got to pull it off that was the best because we loved ed mcmahon we loved johnny and i remember being so young and cocky then <laughs> that we literally would say when we sent it to Ed McMahon, we'd be like, of course he's going to do it. It would be good It would be good for him. We're like, this is good for his career, for him to be in a movie. 
<laughs> we'll be getting in a fist fight with me or something. <laughs> but uh, but that was good. And then and I and I know Apatow was uh, jamming on that with us too. And uh, with the well, well, in the first draft, I just wrote. Um, you know, after all the insults back and forth, uh, Ed McMahon and Happy beat the hell out of each other, and then it was on to the next scene. Um, <laughs> right. But then all the the price is wrong. But I don't know if that was you or Apatow. That definitely wasn't. I think that was Apatow. So Judd Apatow was helping you with the script at this point. Yeah, he was my roommate uh, in in uh, in uh, L.A. And then and then we were getting moving on this movie, and then Judd came up to Vancouver and did a couple of weeks of jamming with us. It was it was fun. This is all we cared about was comedy. I think all you have to do is room with you, and then you get a job for life, don't you, Adam? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's what Hurley he would say. Please help me. <laughs> we had a couple of roommates that I, I don't know where they're probably hanging yeah, out. There's a few somewhere. roommates that, that aren't, aren't in the business that are doing some, uh, I think, what Buscemi uh, does in Billy Madison, staring at our names, wondering that they should kill us or not. Why did Ed McMahon turn it down? I, he probably never even saw it. He's, his manager probably went like, now why would he, I have my guy be around this dumb Adam Sandler guy and fight him and roll around on the grass? But then Bob Barker read it, and his first response, and I know he, he probably tells everybody this, um, was, uh, I'll do it, but I have to win the fight. <laughs> And he, because he uh, fought, his next door neighbor was, was uh, Chuck Norris. Chuck Norris. And so he said, I train with Chuck. We, we tr- train every night. And um, he <laughs> helps me with my punches and my kicks. And I would love to do this, but I have to win this, this fight. And uh, <laughs> we were like, oh, yeah. I think we had to do a rewrite because it was that I beat the hell out of him. And then I think because he wanted to win, we, we changed it to him uh, knock him yeah, out. Oh, yeah. oh, no, I knock him out. Do, who wins the fight? He does. No, he does. He walks away. Yeah, he walks away. Oh. Oh, yeah. he does. That's yeah. right. That's right. That's, that's where he gives right. you the price is wrong. Oh, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Oh, I say the, the price is wrong to him. Then I headbutt him or something, or something like that. Yeah, right? you headbutt him. Yeah. Do you right. remember doing this movie? Yes. That okay. was at a great golf course in Vancouver. Big, big, what was it called? Bear? Something Bear Golf Club. And uh, oh. I... And we, we were rolling around, and it was the greatest time. And he had a stuntman, too. <laughs> he had a stuntman that would do some of the roles. And that guy was like 42 years old. We were like, what the hell happened? <laughs> I, think, I think Bob's 70. You don't look like him at all. And they would put the silver wig on him. And he was, they were like, we couldn't get anyone 70 to roll around on the ground, idiot. We didn't know what we were doing back then. How tough was it to plan that uh, script, that choreography? We got there early in the morning, did it kind of beat for beat with Dennis Dugan, the director, and uh, we did it in the morning, right? I, I wasn't there that day. Oh, oh yeah, you were busy. Yeah, yeah. Hurley, he was there every day on Billy Madison, and then all of a sudden was like he'd show up once every wow. two weeks. Yeah, you got I was writing the, the Wedding Singer. That's what I was doing. Oh, <laughs> take it easy, Hurley. He, he was writing Your the Wedding Singer. smash hit is what I was doing. Uh, but, but when you – now, how much do you allow Bob Barker to say what he wants to say? How scripted was that scene? I think we, we, I think we wrote it pretty verbatim for Bob, and he was cool. And, yeah, he did. we were like, I wonder if he's going to say <laughs> I wonder, and then when he said at the end, we were, everyone was applauding and hugging him, and it was like the greatest moment, yeah. Anybody get hurt? No, I don't think I made, made I think I fell on my head. It was slippery that morning because of the morning dew. I think I slipped and hit my uh, head, but the adrenaline kept me going. I was too excited that I was doing a, a movie. Do you have Vern Lundquist in that scene as the announcer? <laughs> He's the best, yeah. Okay, now you pitched this to Vern Lundquist? I think our friend Jack was like he was very into sports and he he was he was a, one of the producers and he was very excited to have Vern in the movie. Like we thought, oh, we'll cast somebody, and he's like, no, no, we got to have Vern in the movie. And then Jack was in the movie. He played Jack Beard, Vern's. Uh, well, no, Vern. Partner. Vern got there that morning and said, now if if we want to make this real, I I would have someone I would be talking to, you know, and we didn't have anybody there. And then one of us said, Jack, you, you know, you know golf. So you said, he goes, I'm not talking. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Jack is your longtime producing partner, yeah. Jack Garaputo. Back yeah. then, he was just an associate producer. Then he became our, our producing partner, and he, and he was one of our best friends from uh, NYU. Jack knows more about sports than everybody, so, but he did not want to be an actor at all. So when we said be with Vern, he was like, yeah, but I don't want to talk. So then we made that part of the thing that he nods and 
does that kind of thing. Why is it I'm under the impression that you offered that role to Keith Oberman? Maybe we did. Oberman was, was definitely offered some of our movies, right? Danny, you said to me, hey, next time you, you want somebody. Well, I, I saw you at the Knicks game. Yeah. And you were out in the bowels of Madison Square Garden, and I walked yeah. out, and I, I said, hey, Sandman, you go, Danny Patrick. And I, I said, what's up? And he goes, your boy, he f me. Oh, oh, yeah, he was coming or something? Yes, and then he didn't. Must have, it must have been that. It must have been Vern's part. And, and yeah. then he didn't fly three days prior, and then you said, yeah, uh, your boy Oberman was supposed to uh, play the role in uh, Happy Gilmore. And I go, if you ever need somebody, I'm always right. available. And the then water you, boy. And then you go, boy, yeah. you're in my next movie. You got a mustache on, you play a police officer. <laughs> and, and and so I wasn't in Little Nicky. I think that was your next one. And then you cast me in uh, Longest Yard. Or yeah, Oh, no, Water yeah. Boy, I got to play myself. And yeah, I, Water Boy, you were, you were incredible with the whole uh, me smashing uh, uh, records for uh, the most sacks. Something like that. Don't you say, what is in the water? Yes, Harley, you yeah. wrote that. What is in the water? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and and by whatever whatever we call it, something by you, Louisiana. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When did you know that uh, that scene? Because that feels like that's the scene that really stands out in Happy Gilmore. Uh, well, certainly uh, stands out in my day to day life. When I'm walking walking anywhere, I'll hear about Where's ba Bob Barker. <laughs> I hear Where's Bob Barker more than anything in my life. Really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Of all your movies. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Without a doubt. Uh, every age, uh, I had some man say to me at a restaurant two nights ago, and he was like the nicest older man. He goes, I raised my kids on Happy Gilmore, and I tell my grandchildren, and I teach them life lessons. With I say, now look at Happy when he's upset. He can't play well. But when he gets to his happy place, he can putt, and he needs to be calm. And I tell my grandkids that all the time. It's so funny, man. I don't know how that happened. We can't all drive the ball as far as Happy Gilmore, but thankfully for the rest of us, Callaway Golf has created the new Big Bertha B21. Because truth is, there's a ton of distance trapped inside your swing. You just need the technology of Big Bertha to unlock it. And it's pretty simple. A straighter ball equals a longer ball. So Callaway built a whole family of Big Bertha drivers, irons, woods, and hybrids with a new formula for forgiveness. Big Bertha was designed to reduce side spin while generating an insane amount of ball speed, leading to straighter shots off the tee. That's how you unleash your inner distance. That's how you drive like Happy Gilmore. And Callaway made Big Bertha Iron so forgiving, you can practically hit them anywhere on the face and the ball just launches. No matter your swing, Big Bertha gives every shot more distance. Big Bertha is a full family of long, forgiving, and really easy-to-hit clubs. So say hello to the fairway again. Introduce yourself to the green, because this is distance any way you swing it. Unlock your inner distance today at CallawayGolf.com slash Big Bertha. But, you know, you do have life lessons here in your first two movies. I mean, not that it's yeah. a life lesson to be a Bob Barker, but, <laughs> you know, Billy Madison, life lessons, there's anti-bullying, and then you're, you know, this altruistic good guy, Happy Gilmore, eventually, where you're trying to make money. Save grandma. Save grandma's house there. But it really, <laughs> yeah. I see through this, this facade, there's always a beautiful woman who's involved in this, that you're really trying to impress. The same thing with Billy Madison and with Happy Gilmore. Yes, yes, yes. I've always done it for the wrong reasons. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I think we're always kind of resistant. That seems like the studio. Because we thought after Billy Madison, like now that we made a success, like that the studio wouldn't give us notes anymore. And it felt like they gave us more notes. So we always were trying to figure out, okay, like in Billy, like why would this girl ever like Billy when he, all he does is, is eat paste and throw stuff. And so we needed that scene, you know, but that was sort of at the behest of the studio to do something like that. I mean, I'm not That's sure, true. but it sounds That's like true. a studio sort of thing. Yeah. I still, uh, I, I can't imagine that. Did you do a table read with Bob Barker? I don't think so. I don't think Bob was cast then. I think we did a table read. And I remember Covert was playing the homeless caddy. Oh, that's right. Alan Covert, who was a producer, collaborator of yours for a long, long time. Anybody else you found a little difficult or trickier to get on board? I remember Chris McDonald when he was Shooter McGavin, and we were trying to talk him into doing the movie because he, he didn't take it right away. He was, what was that great movie he was in with uh, uh, Thelma and Louise? Thelma and Louise. 
But he was yeah, shooting some so other movie. Yeah, he was, he was in like, the same hotel as us. Yeah, and we saw him, and we met him, and we had lunch with him, and we were like, we got this movie, we're doing it, we would love you to be the guy, and he was kind of like just in a different league than us because he was working with movie stars and we were still goofy. <laughs> and then he finally said, yeah, but, and then I remember on the scene where I break the bottle and I, I go, you know, I threaten him with a bottle in real life. Chris McDonald's a tough dude. So he was, he was like, I don't know, man, I got I'm afraid of this guy. Like he was always a little like, cause I was three <laughs> inches shorter than him. And he looked like he was bigger than me. He was always like, I gotta be afraid of this guy. I'm like, yeah, you probably have been scared of a crazy person before. It doesn't matter how big they are. He'd be like, yeah, but wow, I gotta be afraid of you. Like, wow. <laughs> he was having a hard time with that for a minute. But that was such, a, I mean, that's what he's known for now, right? Oh yeah. He's, he's shooter. He's, he's great. He's great. And when he's one of the, a family member for life. Uh, I do remember it was a it was a moment to get Chris to say yes, right, Hurley? Did we, what made yeah, him do I, remember it? I don't like even he, know. He saw us in the lobby at one point, and after we had asked him, and he saw us, and he turned around the other way and pretended <laughs> he didn't see us, and we chased him through <laughs> yeah, the lobby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it was just uh, just he was hanging out with the real players, and then he saw how <laughs> excited we were <laughs> to be in our movie. Well, I don't know. And then you get lines like, uh, "You eat pieces of." for breakfast. That's right. That's the only <laughs> line me and Hurley, he fight over uh, who wrote it. He says he wrote it and I think I wrote it. Yeah, no, I wrote it and you think you wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give it to you, Hurley. Oh, you, no, you don't give it to me. I, I earned it. You're in big trouble, though, pal. I eat pieces of <laughs> like you for breakfast. <laughs> you eat pieces of <laughs> for breakfast? We kind of do it different every movie. Sometimes, sometimes I'm very involved, sometimes I'm less involved, sometimes we concoct the whole thing very much together. Sometimes we're rewriting another person's script that we need to put in our voice. It, there's no oh, like, from like, movie to movie. It work like this, Danny. I'll, I'm on the phone with him. I'll say something like, maybe Happy goes, you eat pieces of <laughs> for breakfast, then Hurley he types it, <laughs> thinks he wrote it because he types it. <laughs> That's how it works. Let it go, Sandman. <laughs> Let it go. <laughs> you got your independent spirit award. Let me have that. <laughs> oh, yeah, let's hear more about that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's right here next to me. Hang on, let me say hello. <laughs> hey, my little spirit. Yeah. That was the start, the launching of Ben Stiller. What did? Mm. You, how much did you know about Stiller and who wrote his lines as the orderly? That was an Apatow thing, right? Yeah. I got good news. We're extending arts and crafts time by four hours today. My fingers hurt. That? My fingers hurt. Oh, well, oh. now your back's gonna hurt because you just pulled landscaping duty. Hmm. Anybody else's fingers hurt? I think, yeah, I think that, was, that was an Apatow thing. Apatow and Ben were tight. But I knew Ben when I was very young on MTV. I knew him when I was like 18. And then when Apatow was in Vancouver doing the jams with us, he said, man, we should show Grandma more, right? No, no, because I do remember we had the air conditioning dropping on the lady, the lady going, Mister, Mister. <laughs> well, the air conditioner's broken. I'm getting a little warm. Well, just let the kid fix it for you. <laughs> All right. Got the little twisty knobs. That ain't doing it. All right. Hang on, I'll be right down. But the Mister Mister, yeah. that was yes. from my real, my poor grandma lived in Maimonides Nursing Home in Brooklyn, and I went to NYU. And every time I visited grandma in Brooklyn, I would get off the elevator, and there was an older woman, and she would scream at me, Mister Mister, <laughs> get me out of here. And I'd be like, oh, my God, I would be so shook up. So my first five minutes with my grandmother, I would always be like, oh, that lady, want, oh, she wants out, man. What the hell am I doing? i got to help that lady escape. I'm telling you, this place is perfect. You're going to make friends in no time. Mister! Get me out of here! Here, just eat that! Leave us alone! <laughs> Did you keep your uh, Boston Bruins jersey from uh, Happy Gilmore? It's somewhere. It's somewhere. It's at a hard rock or something. I think it, it went to a hard rock. 
What was the place on on Fifty Seventh Street? Not Hard Rock, the one, a uh, Planet Hollywood, well, I think. Yeah, but they, they went they out didn't of business. Keep great track of that stuff back in the day. They, they'd have like wardrobe sales on the last day, and you could buy like stuff from the wardrobe for like a dollar and stuff. Really? Back then, I when I would say, "Hey, I want to keep this," uh, they'd be like, "No, you you can't." <laughs> and now, uh, in my great career, I go, "Hey, I'm keeping this." They go, "I guess." <laughs> <laughs> but I, I like that hockey stick should be in the hockey hall of fame. Oh, oh yeah, no, that's def- that that Odyssey putter. Uh, Odyssey made those putters for us, and they gave me like twenty of them. My father put it up. At, it's actually in my house above the fireplace. Is is that putter? Were you any good at golf? I was okay. I used to play a lot. I mean, I would shoot low 90s back then. Now I'm terrible. But uh, my father was shooting in, uh, in the low 70s. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, he was great. My father used to gamble, and, and uh, I think he you know, had like a six handicap. And, and uh, this was definitely my father's obsession. Me and my brother used to go out with my father, play golf. We, we play like four or five holes. And then we say, can we just drive and watch you? Cause we both tune out. <laughs> Who picked your caddy? That, that was Hurley. He wrote that, the covert of it all. And, and didn't you write it's Alan covert Hurls? Is that how that happened? Because I forget covert. Well, he wasn't in Billy or he was supposed to be something in Billy and the studio wouldn't let us have him. So I think we felt like yeah. we owed him a little bit. What happened was he was originally Norm McDonald's best friend. It was Covert and, and Norm in Billy Madison, and then they wouldn't let us have Covert, so it, it ended up being uh, Mark Beltzman, who's a great guy, and he's hilarious, and he is funnier than Covert. You heard me, Covert. <laughs> <laughs> hey, let's not kick Covert when he's down. <laughs> <laughs> no, Covert's a 10. <laughs> Hey, well, thanks for uh, getting together. I appreciate it. Wish Hurley he would have gotten a little more airtime here, but... Um... I loved cutting them off every time. <laughs> Thank you, guys. And it's been a pleasure. And Hurley, you, you know who wrote it, deep in your heart. <laughs> oh, that's so me. You couldn't have wrote it. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. You. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Listen to that scene with Dan Patrick and other favorite podcasts in the Amazon Music mobile app on your web browser or any Echo device. Then make sure to follow us to get more episodes featuring celebrities like David Spade, Olivia Newton-John, Will Ferrell, and Brian Cranston, only on Amazon Music. IMDb's That Scene with Dan Patrick was created, hosted, and produced by me, Dan Patrick. It's also produced by Brendan Pike, edited by Nathan Moody, and executive produced by Paul Anderson, Nick Pinella, and Andrew Greenwood for Workhouse Media. IMDb's That Scene with Dan Patrick is a production of Dan Patrick Productions and IMDb in association with Workhouse Media. (laughs) 